We've been saddened that a majority of progressives have not understood what's going on in Syria and have lost sight of the hundreds of thousands of Syrians who have demanded their rights. So many on the left are lost in the fog of geopolitics following the tattered flag of a phony anti-imperialism. That's one reason why we decided to dedicate the award this year to the brave doctors and medical workers and rescue volunteers of Syria and give the award to Maysoon al-Misri and Dr. Zahar Salul. The program began with video of the work of four artists. The first is Mark Nelson, a school art teacher from Iowa and an amazing and prolific artist who has taken the Syrian cause as his own. Hello, my name is Mark Nelson, and I am an artist and a teacher living near Chicago, Illinois. I am honored today to be presenting some of my artwork at the Gandhi Peace Award. Especially, I feel the recipients of this award, Dr. Zahir Sahul and Mesuna Masri, are examples of peace, kindness, and courage in the face of war and pain. Um, while the Assad regime in Russia destroys using bullets and bombs, Dr. Zahir and Ms. El Masri have created hope and healing in a very troubled land. The world uh, is an extremely broken place, especially now, and, but I feel that human beings like Dr. Zahir Sahul and Ms. El Masri are rebuilding the world with foundations of compassion and courage. So there are no words to thank them for what they have done to instill peace upon this earth. The drawings that I'm showing today are sketches. Um, I do these very quickly with charcoal, ink, watercolor, and I'm showing them in a certain order. I want to show how from destruction um, through the bombs and the uh, attacks from the Assad regime in Russia, the White Helmet, which Maysoon al Masri was a White Helmet volunteer. How the White Helmets initially go in, they rescue, and then they transfer the victims of these bombings to the medical professionals like Dr. Zahir Sahul. And I wanted to show that kind of path to healing and hope that that happens in Syria. Um, at the very end of the of the drawings, I have a, a few drawings about the current crisis in Idlib, which is the crisis of COVID-19, which is compounding the all the starvation and the hunger and the continued bombing by the regime and its allies. And I, again, the people like Zahir Sahul and Mesun al Masri are, are desperately needed in in places where not only is there war and famine, but also now um, illness. So I hope. Uh, you enjoy the artwork, and I appreciate the opportunity to show it. Thank you.
be sure you see Nelson's updated Syrian version of Goya's Disasters of War. We link to it on the homepage of pepeace.org. Now, Molly Crabapple, an artist with a growing international reputation whose work has graced the Brooklyn Library, a cover of Time magazine, a viral video of AOC's vision of the future, and a book about Raqqa, Syria, called Brothers of the Gun. Connecticut, Adiba Alnumar. She and her family were refugees from Syria. They entered the U.S. exactly on the fateful election day in 2016. The cord of separation and sadness in her early work is now mixed with strains of a vibrant happiness. Hi, Salaam Alaikum. I am Adiba al numar from Syria. I live in Connecticut. أنا اليوم راح أحكي شوي عن الرسم مع الصديقة صديقتي uh, my sister Nancy Latif. Salam alaikum. Hello everyone. Good to be here with you and with Adiba, my friend and sister. Uh, راح أحكي اليوم عن صورة أنا رسمتها uh, هي uh, الريشي. أنا شبهت الريشي للوطن الحبيب سوريا. I would like to start today just to talk a little bit about one of my drawings. Um, it is a feather, which is representative of my deep feelings for my beloved homeland, Syria, and the problems um, that have befallen us. Yes, so many people have asked. Have asked about <coughs> the reasons why people um, have become refugees from their beloved homeland. And the different legs of the journey which have brought people from uh, from Syria to wherever they have landed. 
عوائل شيوخ نساء اطفال of children women men the elderly uh, religious people everyone هجر من بيوتهم رغما عنه in spite of all their efforts to be pulled from their homes by force انا اخذت الفكره من عصفور طائر في السماء i took this idea from a bird that was flying through the sky لو لاحظت بالصورة if you look closely at the picture الناس بتحاول تتمسك بمكانها ببلدها you will see people trying to hold tightly to their home بس رغم عنهم كانوا مجبورين انه يطلعوا غصب عنهم despite their efforts they have been pulled by force and uprooted مثل الشجرة انا بحس الانسان مثل الشجرة لما او اللاجئ لما بتقلعوا من الزورو like a tree pulled by its roots that will not be able to grow again. And yet, it is the dream of the refugee to live in peace with their children, their families. I do like to draw pictures of birds. I feel that birds are free, they have a freedom. Yes, لا مو مثل اللاجئ لازم جواز سفر حتى يقدر يسافر. They don't need any passport in order to travel. Yeah, وبحب يعني أنا عندي بحس رسالة أو مسج لازم وصله للناس لأنه أنا عشت التجربة. My, my uh, feeling to send to you all a message is that I would like all of you to be able to live in peace and to um, be able to have the uh, prosperity of, of freedom and safety. Yes, and I would like to tell you that so many people feel the same as we all do. Inshallah. This is my dream. <laughs> inshallah. Yeah, inshallah. So it is my dream that we will be able to return to our homeland and I believe, it is my belief, that we will do that. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. The final art artist was Akram Swedan. He doesn't use the normal canvas. He turns objects of war into beauty. He is living in unoccupied Syria near Aleppo. He writes, my city Duma in eastern Ghouta was one of the cities that suffered unprecedented bombing and blockade compared to other cities. That's when I wanted to draw the world's attention to this city and in search of peace and to demand human rights. I began collecting remnants of war such as remnants of missiles and bombs and coloring and decorating them to demonstrate the Syrian people's love for life. I named my project Painting on Death.
Please note that the music that accompanied both the videos of Molly Crab Apple and Akram Swedam was composed and played by Tamar Suhuri, an oud player who teaches at the Edward Said National Conservatory of Music in Beit Sahur, Palestine. We will now hear from a Latin teacher from Connecticut and a professional musician who has put his enormous talent at the service of the cause of Syrian freedom. He's vi visited Syria several times and is active with the Syrian American Council. I'm speaking of Dylan Connor. Thanks, Stan, for the introduction. Hello, everybody. It's an honor to be here today. I'm already moved by the <coughs> artwork that we've seen, and I'm honored to be uh, part of this event. Um, Dr. Zahir Sahlul is uh, a friend of mine. Uh, we actually uh, worked on a humanitarian mission together in Jordan to the border of Syria uh, where we got to know each other better. And I have great respect for him as a mentor of mine in this humanitarian work. Congratulations to him. Ms. Masri, uh, obviously a hero of humanity and also I know from Dara, which is special to me because my wife is from Dara as well. And the White Helmets um, actually produced the video for the song I'm about to sing, which is called If Only You'd Listen, uh, from the point of view of a Syrian child. <laughs> Just a child Promise me You'll remember my smile You didn't come And I needed help Though I am gone You can save somebody else If only
Thank you. Thank you to our heroes today, the recipients of this great award, who have de dedicated themselves to saving the lives of Syrians, and especially those Syrian children. Thank you. And now, Wufsi Masarani, an amazing voice from the city of Homs in Syria. He was one of the first Syrian singers who sang for the Syrian uprising in 2011. His songs have become icons since then. He's been performing all over the world and is currently on the U.S. West Coast. It's an honor to be with you and I want to thank all the heroes in Syria still working. I start singing from the beginning and I will continue until all the people will live in peace there and have the freedom they deserve. The first song I want to sing is my homeland, Motini. It's song for each Syrian deserve to live in freedom in his homeland. <clears throat> Oh, 
عن نجواهم من يبالي كون يغرق في سبات من بين الأنقاض يسعى كي يحيي أمل النجاة ليبدد خوفا ورعبا ساد قلوب الأمهات خارجا بين الحطام ينقذ أجساد التباد لا يغيب ولا ينام ينثر أزهار السلام صن يعجزها الكلام بيديهم غرسوه رودا بين حطام الذكريات همتهم تعلو وتسمو فوق اعالي التضحيات هم بين الظلمات نجم يومض في درب السلام Thank you so much everyone. I really appreciate and thank you for each person showing and join us with that great event. Now I'm going to call on the distinguished film director and professional snowboarder Orlando von Eisidel. His films vary widely in topic, but common to them are the stories of the humble heroism from around the world. He won an Academy Award for producing the film Learning to Skateboard in a War Zone if you're a woman, if you're a girl, sorry. And of course, you know he won an Academy Award for directing the film The White Helmets. Orlando von Einzida. It's an honor to join you all today to introduce one of this year's Gandhi Peace Prize, Peace Award winners. Um, in 2015, my partner showed me a video clip of the rescue of a baby trapped under the rubble uh, of his home in Aleppo after an Assad regime missile strike. The, the clip was incredibly moving, but what lingered after watching it was the question of who were the rescuers themselves. It turned out they were a group of normal Syrian civilians, builders, bakers, lawyers, tailors, who had decided not to pick up guns or to leave the country and instead were risking their lives each day to run into the smoke and fire after bombings to rescue complete strangers. They call themselves the Syria Civil Defence, but we know them as the white helmets due to the colour of their protective headwear. Um, I was deeply inspired by their bravery and as a filmmaker it felt like their story was one they could not only cut through some of the noise of the conflict and connect people to Syrian civilians on a human to human level, but also help combat some of the disinformation coming out of Russia and from the Assad regime about the conflict being a simple fight between an elected president and terrorists. Nothing could be further from the truth. Myself and a small film team embarked on a project to make a film about their work which sent us on a number of journeys back and forth to southeast Turkey and the area near the Syrian border to shoot the film and spend many weeks getting to know White Helmet volunteers and the organization's leadership. <clears throat> I'm very fortunate in my work um, in that I get to meet a lot of extraordinary people, but I can honestly say that the people who volunteer for the White Helmets are made of something truly special. The film was released on Netflix and, um, as Stanley mentioned, it went on to win an Academy Award, which myself and my producer, Joanna Natasagara, put down to people being so inspired by the life-saving work of the White Helmets. However, despite global recognition of their efforts and multiple nominations for the Nobel Peace Prize and saving over 200,000 lives while losing almost 200 of their own volunteers, 
a coordinated campaign from Russia and the Assad regime to try and discredit the White Helmets continues and sadly still manages to poison their reputation. This campaign exists because the White Helmets continue to document the war crimes of these regimes upon Syrian civilians in real time and because they destroy the untruthful image of the Syrian conflict the regimes of Assad and Putin have tried so hard to portray. It's here that awards like this are so important. They continue to shine a light on the side of truth and on the tragedy still befalling Syrian civilians. I'm thrilled to be able to introduce Mason al Masri, this year's recipient of a Gandhi Peace Prize Award. After graduating from the Department of Media at the University of Damascus, Mason worked for the Syrian government's official Sana news agency. However, after seeing the organization's manipulation of the news, and its propaganda against peaceful protesters in the wake of the country's 2011 uprising, she quit to become an independent journalist documenting human rights violations. As the war intensified, Mason's brother was tragically killed by a regime sniper. He died in her arms, but in an effort to prevent this happening to others, Mason paused her journalism work and dedicated her life to trying to save the lives of civilians. She was one of the first female White Helmet volunteers. Today, Mason lives in Canada after the regime took control of the city of Quinichia, where she was forced to flee for her life. Despite being humanitarian workers, the Syrian regime sees White Helmet volunteers as traitors and directly targets them in their strikes. The White Helmets have a motto from the Quran, to save one life is to save all of humanity. Mason, I thank you wholeheartedly for your sacrifice and for your contribution to human life. Congratulations on winning this award. We urge you to watch the entire 40-minute film on YouTube. All you have to do is search for the words YouTube White Helmets and the link will pop up. Now I'd like to introduce the president of Promoting Enduring Peace, James Van Pelt. He's a graduate of the Yale Divinity School and has been activated, active with Promoting Enduring Peace since 1989. He's written a number of books, including Vince Ramos, In Gandhi's Footsteps, and a book about immigration, Seeking Home in a Strange Land. James Van Pelt. Thank you, Stan. Um, my first purpose is to say that the honor of this award is really, is really our honor to affiliate ourselves with the people who sh show so much courage and so much uh, compassion um, is a great honor for us. To, un to let you understand what the prize is all about, what the Gandhi Peace Award is all about, I'd like to talk for just a few minutes about the people who have received it before this time. Last year, it was received by Jackson Brown, perhaps the leading popular singer uh, in terms of uh, dedication to progressive and charitable causes. And tonight we continue that tradition of recognizing that progress relies on the heart as well as on the mind that progress, therefore, depends on the arts as much as it does diplomacy or, or demonstrations. The film that we've just seen a little sliver of has moments that you will never forget. For example, there's a moment that will change and deepen your understanding of what true happiness is. And there are moments that will remind you of how villainous and evil people 
after power can be. Other awards have been won by Amy Goodman, who's a great progressive journalist, reminding us that the clarity of the truth of the situation is all important as it is in this case, in the case of the Syrian struggle. It was won by Bill McKibben, who is the founder of the 350.org um, environmental organization, and who reminds us that peace requires harmony, not just among people, but among humans and their environment. And hence our motto, peace on earth, peace with earth. Another example is Arik Asherman and Ehud Bandel of the Rabbis for Human Rights, who interposed their bodies between the uh, Israeli, Israeli savagery and the Palestinians trying to survive it. And again, we see the kind of courage that we've seen in that little snippet. Our organization is very proud to be affiliated with others who are great peace heroes and great figures in the progressive struggle, such as Dorothy Day, who founded the um, Catholic Worker Organization, or uh, Medea Benjamin, who has him opposed the president face to face, or Omar Barghouti, who is the founder of the uh, movement to boy boycott uh, certain corporations contributing to the savagery between the Palestinians and the Israelis. The founder of uh, boycott, divestment, sanctions movement. And I call him, I, I bring him up because just like the distortion of reality that makes it difficult for people to understand what's really going on in Syria. In the same way, um, it's difficult for people to understand what's really going on between the Israelis and the Palestinians. So tonight, we bind the reputations of promoting enduring peace and Syria civil defense and Med Global together. And just as our organization gave away the first award 60 years ago this year, for the next 60 years and beyond that, when people speak of promoting enduring peace, they will remember the struggle of the people of Syria and the courage, bravery, and compassion of the White Helmets. Thank you. To read the certificate to Mason al Misri, our Vice President, Kate Frazier. Hello. As part of our PEP award, we give the honorees a certificate and a medallion and a plaque. And I'm honored that these two Mason uh, Mossery. For the certificate, it says um, to Mason Al Al Mossery, for your efforts in building Syria civil defense, helping to create the white helmets the group that organized to dig people out of the rubble of Assad bombings and to reveal to the world the extent of the crimes against civilians. 
for personally bringing food and first aid to Syrian demonstrations, helping the injured, and using your journalists to document government abuses and murders. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against neither they learn war anymore. And the certificate is signed by Paul Hodel, our president emeritus, and James Clement Van Pelt, our president we just heard from. Um, so we, we also give a medallion to the honorees. And um, the medallion, I think, if, you, if we have one to show online. Um, beginning in 2012, the Gandhi Peace Award Medallion was created by From War to Peace, a California company that uses recycled copper from disarmed nuclear missile systems to create peace bronze, the most precious metal in our world. So we're giving this to both honorees. And the, we also um, will add their name to a plaque um, that goes on our statue of Gandhi um, that, uh, that, that the names will be engraved on that, on that plaque um, as part of the statue. So now uh, I present to you Mason Al-Masri. Hello everyone, Assalamu alaikum. Um, it's, uh, it's a great honor for me to be amongst the Gandhi Beast Prize winners. And the prize was previously awarded to amazing people who, whose uh, names have been celebrated due to their struggle to achieve peace uh, in their uh, countries and societies. Today, I remember uh, 19 January 2013. On that day, my brother was shot by an Al-Assad forces sniper. And I felt helpless like a steel stone. My mother held him as he took, he took his last breath and I was unable to do anything. I wished for death a hundred of times. As this uh, image of my brother reminds uh, engraved in my memory and the help, help lessons lay heavy on my chest like a block of ice. I remind and the, so sorry, it's not easy, but okay. I reminded in the states until 2015. And then the board started to ease a, a little and uh, my sense of uh, guilty for my inability to save my brother become a driving force to help me people, to, to help me people by become a volunteer in the White Helmets organization. I fought in silence and uh, overcome my uh, sense of, of help, uh, helplessness and overwhelming pain. The White Helmets, uh, provide hope for the people by revenge their uh, suffering uh, and safe lives. It has been ex extens extensively targeted by the Assad forces and the Russia Air Force. They target, they target the White Helmet centers and teams while they Perform, perform their humanitarian duty. 287 white service volunteers were killed while 
prefer reforming their humanitarian, humanitarian work. And many uh, white helmet center and the vehicles uh, were destroyed. Today, the White Helmets organization is still working in full caps capacity to our school lives and elevate the uh, suffering of people's lives living in Northern Syria. At this, this time, civilians and our teams are still being shell shelled by virus weapons. The COVID-19 pandemic poses a new th threat to people in North Syria and the White Helmet is working with all its capacities to contain the virus and protect people's lives as much as possible. I am speaking uh, to I am speaking today uh, from my new country, Canada. In 2018, Canada helped my helped me and saved the lives of 106 white helmet volunteers in southern Syria after the Assad Russia and Iran affiliated militias took control of the areas where we used to work. Many of college couldn't accompany us and many were arrested. Some of them were killed while others fled to North Syria. Today, we live in safety and we have comforts and a decent life while the people living in the areas controlled by the Al-Assad Russia and Ira Iranian military forces in southern Syria are ex experiencing force uh, measures. Over 400 people have been killed and 1,280 uh, 93 citizens, including women and children, have been arrested. The South, Southern uh, regime has been empty of its uh, youth. As the regime witness, witnesses the so-called death migration from the South to Northern Syria, and then Turkey to skip our skip our assets or compulsory military services and al Assad force. The South the Southern regime is being punished using starfish starfish policy and depriving a resident of basic service. There is an increase in the number of these below the poverty line and case, cases of malnutrition have emerged, especially among children. In addition, the coronavirus is spreading without any real effort to confront we communicate with uh, some people in the regime to check on the and them, and they answer with, "If only the bombing had continued, as then at last the whole family will die together." But today, they watch their loved ones die on one after another without being able to save them. Slow, da slow death, death is waiting for us. Today, international 
community must work to help these Syrian people who are experiencing a tra tragedy. They are victims of the uh, conflicts of international interests began applied, applied out of their land and the exchange of control and inf influence over the region. A th thousand of detainees, including women and children, remained in the all Assad force prison. They survive. They survive in harsh condition, with the ever ever present period of torture and death, and without any uh, anyone known about them. The international community must pay attention to these issues of the forcibly disappeared detainees in Syria and work to achieve their release, release and save their lives. And, 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 and in closing, this award is for every member of this white helmet. It is for every Syrian woman. It's for my mother, who I was forced to leave behind. And now she is the care, the care, the care of 20 children who lost their father and taken, taken care of several widows. For this, that woman who is over 70 and is still plants her land, a harvesting fruit and supporting women and caring for orphans. To all my families, uh, to all my friends every, everywhere, to my family in Syria, they living and they died who I was forced to leave them and I miss them there. And every moment be well. To my husband who support me and always stand beside me. Thank you for all these people. Thank you for all, all our friends. Thanks for every person work and humanitarian work and, and thanks for uh, my colleagues in, inside Syria uh, who still work in white helmets. Thanks for everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Maysoon. And we are so happy to be of some assistance to the white helmets. Now it's my privilege to introduce Linda Sarsour. She's a renowned Palestinian Muslim American activist and a proud advocate of Brooklyn, New York. She was one of the leaders of the immense Women's March in 2017. That year, Time Magazine said she was one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Linda Sarsour. Thank you so much, Stan. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and all of our friends at Promoting Enduring Peace. I'm so honored and humbled to be here with all of you today. Um, when I think about the history of Promoting Enduring Peace, uh, founded in 1952, which is 28 years before I was born, and I hope that you are all proud that there is still a generation um, that came after you, a generation like mine who continues to be anti-war, uh, continues to promote and be committed to our earth um, and continues to work towards a world where there is justice and peace. I, as Stan shared with you, I'm a very proud and unapologetic Palestinian American and I'm grateful to promoting enduring peace for also recognizing in the past Omar Barghouti. It shows the type of commitment to justice and the political courage that promoting enduring peace has to uh, 
honor a man like Omar Barghouti, who was one of the first uh, Palestinians in Palestinian society to call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions of the state of Israel based on their human rights violations of the Palestinian people. And it is very fitting today that this award that I will be presenting to another great humanitarian, uh, a, a man who is not just a physician and a professional, but someone who has committed his life uh, to uplifting humanity, to alleviating pain, harm, and suffering, not just amongst his beloved people of Syria, but for people all over the world, including to my beloved people in Palestine. I had a journey um, two years ago to Jordan, and I went to Ramthe, which is on the border of Jordan and Syria. And I got to meet firsthand and be with amongst for many days, Syrian refugees. And I got to hear their stories firsthand. I got to sit uh, and cry along with mothers who had lost their loved ones, their children, some their spouses, some their fathers and many their brothers. And I have been moved by the Syrian revolution since day one. As a Palestinian, I have been committed to the liberation of the Syrian people, just as I have been committed to the liberation of the Palestinian people. Dr. Zahid is a man of great courage. He goes to the most dangerous places to provide and bring some light. Syria is one of the most dangerous places for medical professionals. And it does not stop Dr. Zahir Sahlul from risking his life, a man with a beautiful wife, Suzanne, and wonderful children that he leaves behind, that he goes and risks his life for others. I won't forget that just in the right before the virus last year and the year before, watching Dr. Zahir Sahlul go to Gaza, a place that is very beloved to me as a Syrian American doctor to go support and provide healthcare services to the Palestinian people of Gaza who have been living in an open air prison. Not only is Dr. Zahir Sahlul a man of great political courage who has committed to alleviating the harm and suffering of people all over the world. I'm watching him be a hero today here in the United States of America and what, being able to witness what he's seen in Syria, the overcrowdedness uh, of hospitals, the scarcity of resources, and still going through all of that to make sure that people had a kind man, someone who is going to show them that there still is hope amidst all the darkness. He's doing that here in Chicago hospitals for those who have fallen to the coronavirus. I want you to know, Dr. Zahir Sahlul, that I am very honored to call you a friend, uh, to see the, an experience and to be alive to witness the work that you have done for our communities as an Arab American leader, a Muslim American leader. And I want all the folks that are here today to know that Dr. Zahir Sahlul is the best that our Muslim American communities have to offer, our Arab American communities have to offer. And I'm pretty sure that I will speak on behalf of Syrians, although I am not a Syrian myself, that he is the best that the Syrian American community has to offer. And so you, this honor that you're receiving today, Dr. Zahir, is, is, is one that is well-deserved. Um, you deserve every honor, and I'm grateful to the people at Promoting Enduring Peace for recognizing your work and for giving you your flowers while you are here today with us. And I will say this to you, Dr. Zahid, inshallah, one day, and I believe it in the deepest part of my heart, that you and I will meet one day in a free Syria, and then we'll take a trip over to be together in a free Palestine. Congratulations. Wonderful remarks. Just today, Dr. Salul received a brief letter from a U.S. Senator. I'm going to call on our treasurer, Dan Fisher, to read it. It's my pleasure to read this letter that comes from Senator Richard J. D uh, Durbin from Illinois. Dear Dr. Salul, it gives me great pleasure to congratulate you for receiving the Gandhi Peace Award. I can't think of a more deserving recipient. The Gandhi Peace Award recognizes those who have made contributions in the promotion of international peace and goodwill. Your work through the Syrian American Medical Society and MedGlobal is legendary. The numerous missions you've made to Syria, Jordan, and countries around the world to assist medical teams that were under assault is commendable. Over the years, 
you've shared with me the devastating realities faced by refugees and displaced persons in crisis afflicted areas around the world. I'm aware that you've often put your own life at risk to care for the injured, a testament to the great compassion you've shown to the most vulnerable among us. I also want to recognize the exemplary work you've done as a pulmonary specialist to treat patients with COVID-19 right here in Illinois. Congratulations again on being recognized with this prestigious award. You make the world a better place. Sincerely, uh, Richard J. Durbin, United States Senator. Thank you, Dan. And now our secretary, Francis Elliott Frazier, will read the certificate to Dr. Salul. Hello, alhamdulillah. Thanks to God. I have the pleasure of reading the certificate to you. To Dr. Muhammad Saher Salul for inspiring and organizing physicians and other medical workers to care for Syrians injured during attacks by the Assad regime, for your frequent visits to Syria under perilous conditions, for founding organizations such as Med Global to provide medical services to Syria, Gaza, and a dozen other areas around the world. For your work in Chicago, treating those afflicted by the COVID-19 virus pandemic, and also for your struggle to eliminate the pandemic in all parts of Syria at great risk to your own well being. Signed by Stanley Heller, Administrator, and James Clement Van Pelt, President. This award, this certificate and award, also comes with a check for $5,000 cash prize, which is shared by the honorees. Congratulations. I'm humbled, uh, Linda, by your uh, introduction. I recently finished uh, reading your book. Uh, took some time, but I finished it. Uh, we are not here to be bystanders. Uh, I recommend it for everyone. Um, Sister Linda is one of the most uh, powerful voices in the progressive and the Muslim communities. She speaks in her book about uh, how she grew up as Palestinian Muslim American in Brooklyn and how she became a global activist on behalf of uh, marginalized communities. Uh, Linda deserves uh, many awards uh, for her courage, solidarity with the uh, marginalized, with the disenfranchised, and also for striving for justice and peace everywhere. Um, thank you, Linda. And let us learn from her um, not to be uh, bystanders, uh, be an upstander. Stand up for your rights, stand up for justice, stand up for, for the refugees, for the displaced, and stand up for Native Americans and the people of color. Stand up for the Rohingya in Myanmar, for the Uyghurs in China, for the Venezuelan victims of tyranny, for the Yemeni victims of geopolitical war, and for the Palestinians. The Palestinian cause is dear to my heart. My family and I are the product of the generous and the welcoming Palestinian community in Bridgeview, Illinois. My wife and I witnessed the same hospitality in Gaza under siege uh, in one of the mid global medical missions. In spite of the siege and the occupation, the Palestinian people prevail with their resilience, with their beautiful souls and culture, and with their unmatched generosity. It is frankly my honor to receive Gandhi Peace Award on behalf of the Syrian healthcare workers. Alongside Maysoon Al-Masri representing Syrian humanitarian and rescue workers, Mabrook to the White Helmet, Alf Mabrook, much deserved Raid al-Saleh and all the brave volunteers of the White Helmets. During my dozen medical missions in war-torn Syria, my homeland, I have had the, to trust smugglers 
and drive through sniper's alley, crawl under border fences, jump walls, walk for hours without light over mountain passes, and survive near misses from barrel bombs. I forced myself to write up ads, to advocate, to speak, to fundraise like there's no tomorrow. I worked and slept in underground hospitals in Aleppo and Idlib and other places that were bombed multiple times. They did not teach us, teach us that in medical school. It was a long and turbulent journey, but it was very fulfilling. About 10 years ago, hundreds of thousands of young Syrians went to the streets chanting for freedom and human rights. They believe that peaceful demonstrations and civil disobedience will force the Assad regime to accept their rightful demands. The regime responded with extreme brutality, with snipers, with bullets, with torture at industrial scale, with siege, with nerve gas and barrel bombs. The regime agents al Mukhabarat snatched injured demonstrators from many hospitals, from the operating rooms, from the intensive care units, and tortured the doctors who treated them. When doctors built field hospitals to treat the injured during demonstrations, the regime bombed the field hospitals. People rebelled and, forced, and, they, were, and they were forced to defend themselves and their dignity and their neighborhoods. They built hospitals and schools underground, in chicken farms, in basements of buildings, basement of churches and mosques, and even in caves. What started as peaceful demonstrations was transformed into a brutal geopolitical war. The Syrian people were the victims. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., one of my heroes, who was also a recipient of Gandhi Award 1964, said, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. We expected everyone who loved freedom and hated tyranny to stand up with the Syrian people, but we were shocked. Some people in the left and the peace movements remained silent, while others who must not be named stood with the tyrant. Some even participated willfully in disinformation warfare against the Syrian people. They mocked the, vic the victims and promoted idiotic conspiracy theories. I am very grateful for promoting enduring peace and its leadership for trying to reorient the peace movement and the left on this crisis where many pro progressives have gone astray. The Syrian crisis has changed the world. What happened in Syria was not contained in Syria. The brutality of the Assad regime unleashed the worst refugee crisis since World War II. Half of the Syrian population have been displaced. Today, there are still 5.6 million Syrian refugees. One out of four refugees in the world is from Syria. There's 25 million refugees in the world. As the Somali poet Warsan Shire said, no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. You have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. Half a million Syrian lost their lives and tens of thousands disappeared in Assad's prison. They were tortured to death. Women were raped. The Syrian crisis normalized the use of chemical weapons, the attacks on healthcare, and the starve to surrender tactics. All are crimes against humanity. It also undermined 150 years of medical neutrality and Geneva conventions. On my Twitter handle is the drawing of a child from Aleppo. I would like you to look at, at the drawing. And you can see the drawing of this child from Aleppo, where you have helicopters throwing barrel bombs 
Barrel bombs are barrels, sometimes as big as the dumpsters, garbage dumpsters, stuffed with TNT and shrapnels. It's a cheap way to kill people, mutilate children, and cause destruction. Very cheap, but it's a weapon of mass destruction. It's not a smart bomb. It's a dumb bomb, but it has been used tens of thousands of times in Syria while the world was just turning the other way. In this drawing of the child, you can see the impact of the barrel bombs. Houses on fire, children are mutilated, they are bleeding. But strangely, this child, you know, the innocent child drew the children who are dead, they were smiling. And the children who are alive are crying. Children don't lie. A Syrian refugee crisis unleashed the anti-refugee and anti-immigrant sentiments in Europe and the United States. It led to the rise of hate groups and populism. It led to Brexit. It led to the spread of xenophobia, Islamophobia, and, they, and, and also to the election of certain opportunistic politicians in many countries, including the United States of America. Countries started to build walls on their borders instead of opening walls. Against all of our values, our country resettled only 20,000 Syrian refugees. Germany, on the other hand, resettled more than 600,000 Syrian refugees. Our neighbor to the north resettled more than 50,000 Syrian refugees. Governor Pence, now a vice president, was the first governor in the, state, in the United States, in his state, Indiana, who prevented Syrian refugees from resettling in his state. President Trump closed the door completely by his travel ban. That is a shameful act. It's a stain on our legacy as a nation that was always open to the huddled masses yearning to be free. I am optimistic that President-elect Biden, who pledged to reopen the door once again to Syrian and other refugees, will correct that stain, will remove it from our legacy as a nation. In the past four decades, our country wel welcomed over three million refugees from all over the world. Refugees have built new lives and communities in towns and cities in all 50 states. Immigrants and refugees are assets, not a burden. Diversity is an asset, not a burden. Syrian Americans are among the most successful immigrants. Many are healthcare professionals at the front line of fighting COVID patients, COVID and other diseases. They treat and heal millions of our fellow citizens. There are also famous Syrian artists, Syrian American artists, actors, rappers, entrepreneurs, scientists, businessmen, and governors. Every Syrian American is proud that Steve Jobs is the son of a Syrian immigrant. Syrian immigrant Ernest Hamwi invented the ice cream cone during the St. Louis World Fair in 1904. Everyone who enjoys ice cream and the iPhone should feel indebted to Syrian immigrants. I am also humbled to be the first Muslim and probably the second Arab American who received Gandhi Award. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, set the foundation for nonviolence 14 centuries ago. He taught us whoever witnessed an injustice, she or he should change it by hand. And if not, then by words. And if not, then by heart. And that is the weakest of faith. He asked us to be merciful and compassionate. He asked us to walk lightly on earth, to be humble and to be respective of God's creation. He asked us to care about the orphans, the widows and the poor. He asked us to seek peace and not to seek revenge. But he also taught us that justice is a prerequisite for an enduring peace. Without justice, there is no enduring peace. When I marched with my brothers and sisters in Chicago against the Iraqi war, 
against the Muslim ban and for Black Lives Matter, I believed in the teaching of one of my heroes, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who said, justice is indivisible. You cannot segregate your moral concerns. Injustice everywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Throughout the Syrian crisis, I have met many of those who embodied the message of Martin Luther King. The Syrian people are indebted to you, my brothers and sisters. You have seen some of them today, like Mark Nelson and Mali and, uh, and others. Mark Nelson, an art teacher, school teacher uh, from a small city in Kewanee, Illinois. Uh, like also Dylan Connor, like the, also the 3,000 American women who ran Stand with Aleppo campaign. Hi, Becky, uh, Tracy, Harriet, Leah, and Wendy. Like Dr. John Kaler, a pediatrician from the south side of Chicago. Dr. Kaler, who was 69 years old, joined me at that time in 2016 in unforgettable medical mission at the peak of the bombings and the siege of Aleppo. He wanted to treat the children of Aleppo after the death of Dr. Wissam Al Ma'az by a missile in his hospital, Al Quds Hospital in Aleppo, while he was on duty. When we, were when we returned back with the help of a group of diverse doctors and nurses, we founded MedGlobal, a medical NGO that provided and provides healthcare to disaster regions all over the world. More than 700 doctors and nurses from 25 countries joined MedGlobal to partner with local communities and build resilience in war-torn countries like Yemen, Gaza, Iraq, Syria, and other countries to lend a hand of healing to the Rohingya and the Venezuelan refugees, to reduce healthcare disparity in Chicago and other places in the United States, and to help frontline healthcare workers during their ordeal fighting COVID. I invite you to check out and support MediGlobal. We can build peace through health and health through peace. Disparity is more dangerous than wars and pandemics. According to Physicians for Human Rights, more than 550 hospitals were bombed in Syria. And more than 923 doctors, nurses, and medics were killed by mostly the Assad regime and its allies, Russia and Iran. Every nurse and doctor who was killed in Syria has a story, had a dream, and a family like you. I had the honor to work with some of them. They deserve this award and many other awards, more than me. Dr. Mah Dr. Mahmoud Al Hariri, Dr. Abdul Aziz, an Aleppo surgeon who I witnessed after his hospital, Al Zarzur, was bombed and he was trying to salvage some of the medical supplies so he can use it for the next patient. Dr. Hussam Al Nahas, a medical student who organized an amazing um, infrastructure to help the victims of chemical weapons. He read about it in Google and implemented in many cities in Syria. Dr. Mahmoud from Al Ghouta in a city called Ain Tarma, who was in the middle of the night on August 21st, 2013, when his hospital was flooded with 700 people choking to death after they were exposed to sarin gas. He had to choose which patient he had to save and which patient he will let die because he did not have enough ventilators for all of them. 144 patients at that night died in his hospital. Most of them are children. Dr. Tenari in the city of Sarmin, who also uh, survived a chemical weapon attack with chlorine gas. Dr. Ikhtiyar, an orthopedic surgeon from Latakia, who left his lucrative practice to build a field hospital in the mountain to save the injured in his hometown. Dr. Rami, who left his lucrative practice in the United Kingdom in Leicester to be the doctor in the front line in the mountain of Latakia. Dr. Abu Muhammadin, urologist who worked in underground hospital in the city of Aleppo because it was bombed 17 times 
until it was rebuilt underground for protection. The nurse Abu Rajab, who was injured himself multiple times while trying to treat the victims of barrel bombing in his neighborhood, as Sahur. Nurse Bara, Bara'a, who I met in Aleppo. And when I was testif testifying in the United Nations Security Council about the siege of Aleppo, I asked her, what would you like me to share with the members of the United Nations Security Council? She said, there is a patient in my hospital. She's a child, her name is Sarab. She's injured in her brain because of barrel bomb. Can you ask the members of the United Nations Security Council to evacuate her to Turkey? Maybe she can, she can be saved. The United Nations Security Council members were not able to evacuate Sarab to Turkey. She died. Dr. Farida, the only ob specialist in the city of Aleppo, and Dr. Lubna Saad, pediatrician in the province of Idlib, who was traumatized after she was displayed herself with her family from her city, Ma'arat al numan uh, in the recent bombing campaign by the Assad regime. Dr. Noor, Noor Akhras, Dr. Basil Atasi, Dr. Abdul Ghani Sankari, who joined me in the first medical mission of the Syrian American Medical Society to help, Syri to help Syrian refugees in Antioch, Turkey. And the hundreds of volunteers and staff members of the Syrian American Medical Society, the Union of Medical Care and Relief Organizations, USAM, and the Syrian Expatriate Medical Association, SEMA, and the American Relief Coalition for Syria. I dedicate Gandhi Award to the people who deserve it, the medical professionals who have been killed in Syria while treating patients and serving their communities under the principle of medical neutrality. Let me tell you some of their stories. Dr. Hassan Al-Araj was a compassionate and exemplary cardiologist who dedicated his life to serving his community. Before the start of the conflict, Dr. Hassan worked as a cardiologist in Hama province where he ran the Kafar Zeta Specialty Hospital. When protests began in Syria in 2011, Dr. Hassan treated protesters and other injured during violent crackdown. After his hospital was bombed multiple times, he realized that his colleagues and patients needed a creative way to protect them. He led the effort to build the Central Cave Hospital of Syria, a hospital dug in the mountain to provide free treatment to the community while protecting those inside the hospital from attacks. I visited him in the hospital in 2016. He told me that he would like to convert it to a museum after the crisis to show the world the extreme that Syrian doctors went through to provide healthcare to their communities. Dr. Hassan did not live to see his dream. On April 13, 2016, as he was leaving his hospital, his ambulance was targeted with a heat seeking missile from a Russian airplane. He was killed by this targeted attack. Dr. Hassan will be always remembered. He was a friend and inspiration to all of those who knew him. Dr. Wasim al Mu'az. Dr. Wasim, Muhammad Wasim Mu'az, was one of the best pediatricians in Aleppo. In 2016, he was one of the last remaining pediatricians in the east side of the city under siege. He stayed, he stayed in Aleppo even while the deadly violence escalated and siege tightened to continue to serve his patients. Dr. Wasim worked as the, at the children's hospital during the day and at night he attended to emergencies at Al-Quds Hospital. As a pediatrician, he saved the lives of countless children throughout the conflict. On April 27, 2016, an airstrike on Al-Quds Hospital decimated the facility and killed Dr. Wasim, also killed a dentist, three nurses, and 22 civilians inside the hospital. We will always remember Dr. Muaz as the kindest and bravest of souls whose devotion to treating the youngest victims of war was unparalleled. And finally, Dr. Majid, Dr. Muhammad Majid Bari. He was a physician with a humanitarian organization called Saving Lives. He had graduated with honors from Aleppo University Medical School. Dr. Majid's colleagues and friends remember him as a kind, compassionate, and talented physician. On October 15, 2014, Dr. Majid was transporting patients in an ambulance in Aleppo when a heat-seeking missile targeted and struck his vehicle. He was killed along with three other civilians. 
after his, his death, I mean, I've not, I'm not a poet, but I wrote these spoken words in his memory. And Amina al-Masri, a Syrian American educator from Massachusetts will read these spoken words. Thank you, Dr. Sahib. Many of my colleagues left Aleppo because they were afraid about losing their lives. Some of my friends were detained, tortured, and killed just because they insisted on working as doctors. They swore to save lives. They were treated like cr criminals or even worse. They were told the whole world respect we were told the whole world respects our neutrality. We were told the Geneva Convention guarantees our impartiality. We were told that being a doctor is like being an angel. You give from yourself to heal your patient. The regime did not respect any of that. The world did not rush to help us. We suffered in silence like my homeland. Some of my friends died drowning, trying to flee on a boat to a new land of hope. They were swallowed by unsympathetic waves of the Mediterranean Sea. I stayed. I stayed because it is my duty to save lives. I stayed because if I left, who else will stay? Who else will offer a hand of a healing to a sobbing child pulled out of, out of the rubble of her home destroyed by a barrel bomb? Who else will vaccinate the children in my neighborhood so they don't have polio or measles? Everyone left us, for, left us to face our fate. We have no one but God. He is watching those who, who deserted us. I guess he's testing them and testing us. I don't expect anyone to react to my death. I don't expect anyone to stop the killing in my hometown. I lost my faith in humanity, but I lived a fulfilling life and I don't regret a minute I had serving my patients. I will join another 560 Syrian doctors who were killed by the war criminals. My patients, my patient will miss me, and so my wife and two young children. I will miss what's left of my city and homeland. I will miss the courage of my colleagues who are still working, saving lives as usual. I will miss their faith, their warmth, and their humor. And I will miss the sounds of the barrel bombs. It is too silent here. It is too cold. It is too dark. It is too unSyrian. Pray for me and for my homeland. Rest in peace, Dr. Majid. Thank you, Dr. Sahib. So um, I thank God for his immense blessings. I thank my parents, humble elementary school teachers in the windy city of Syria, Homs, who taught me the most simple and timeless values of hard work, aiming high and believing in my dreams. I thank my wife, Suzanne, for being both the parents and the friend to our children when I was absent physically or mentally, for standing with me throughout my turbulent journey and for her sacrifices, endurance, and wisdom. I thank, I thank my children, Adham, Mahdi, and Marwa for volunteering in medical missions and to help their communities, for succeeding in school when I am in harm's way, for growing up to be successful, caring, and civically engaged, and for, for being proud Syrian and Muslim Americans. I thank our partners in this long journey, the foundations, the faith and civic leaders in Syria Faith Initiative, my mosques in Chicago, in Bridgeview, and Burridge, the many churches, mosques, synagogues, and temples that paid attention to Syrian refugees and children. They held prayers and raised funds, especially the Church of Later Day Saints and many others. Thank you, Senator Durbin and Senator Duckworth for your support. Thank you for every member in our government and UN agencies and many other governments 
who cried for the Syrian children and refugees and made sure that they did the right thing in spite of the mounting obstacles. I thank my friend, my associates in clinical practice, my board of directors, our selfless volunteers, my extended family on social media and everyone who donated to help someone whom she never met. I won't be able to remember all of you, but each one of you has a special place in my heart and in the hearts of the Syrian people. I was in Idlib province in Northwest Syria on January of this year, right before the COVID pandemic hit us. In a medical mission organized by a collaboration between local Syrian NGO called Violate, our, our organization and my organization Mid Global. There are 4.5 million Syrian refugees in Idlib. Half of them are displaced from other regions. 1.2 million of them live in camps, in tents. 1,250 camps. At that time, there was a barbaric campaign waged by the Syrian regime and the Russian Air Force. More than 65 hospitals in the province of Idlib were bombed. 1.4 million civilians were displaced to a small strip of land near the Turkish border. They had nowhere to go. In one of the camps, I met with a group of children. Two of them were best friends, Hasma and Huda. They were nine years old. Both of them were displaced with their families from a small village north of Hama, seven times before they ended up in this muddy small camp near the city of Idlib. They walk every day for two hours in the mud and rain to reach a nearby school. We had a campfire in the cold rainy night, rainy night, about 50 beautiful children gathered around. And I asked them, who wants to be a doctor in the future? Almost all of them raised their small hands. Several wanted also to be engineers to build their destroyed homes. And even one of them wanted to be a president. They were singing, smiling, and dreaming in spite of the cold, the displacement, and our apathy. These beautiful and innocent children deserve our attention, my friends. Asma and Huda deserve our attention. Dear brothers and sisters, let us use this momentum generated by this award and the promising changing in our nation as a drive towards fulfilling the aspiration of the Syrian people restoring peace and national reconciliation, the return of refugees, and rebuilding what has been destroyed in the cradle of civilization. And let me end with this quote from Mahatma Gandhi. They ignore you, they laugh at you, they fight you, then you win. Thank you very much. Jazakumullah khairan. Outstanding sentiments in a fine poem. I so wish, wish we could have the usual applause and ovations for each of our speakers. But perhaps we feel this virtually. Please spread their message. We often neglect thank yous for the people behind the scenes who have made the event possible. PEP would like to express our gratitude to the producer of this Zoom event, Mitch Link, and to our translator, Notre Dame student, Muhammad Al-Wahid. And of course, thank you to the artists, singers, activists who volunteered to be on this program. Thank you all for watching. Keep checking our website, pepeace.org, for future events and campaigns. Goodbye.